Hello and welcome to the Cloister Bell podcast, a bizarrely scheduled Doctor Who podcast presented by Rob and Liam. In this podcast, we will be reviewing The Timeless Children. Hello and welcome back to the podcast. First off, uh, we apologise for the delays and whatnot in getting material out, but this has been unavoidable uh, due to crazy personal schedules with work, family, other commitments, and then of course the whole world becoming bloody bizarre. Uh, it's strange to think the world's a different place since we last recorded. It is very much. Uh, we hope you're all well and able to cope with the current situation as best you can, and your health is tip-top. Uh, for future historians who may be listening to this in the year 2035, this has been recorded on 18th of April 2020 during the COVID-19 lockdown. We're living through interesting historical times, people. Uh, yeah. Um, we will be reviewing The Timeless Children, and when we recorded the last two podcasts looking at the haunting of Villa Diodanti and the Ascension of the Cybermen, they were recorded quite close to when they were originally broadcast, which was only back in February. But my God, does that feel like a lifetime ago? It does. A lot of it's probably... You can probably blame me because I didn't do the editing very quickly. No, but... no, no. I did, just no. Well, that's what I meant before because, you know, th- um, you know, we had crazy um, schedules anyway with work and, uh, uh, and family and all the rest of it. So, yeah, mm. we were a bit behind, but that, unfortunately, that couldn't be uh, avoided. But they, um, when we did record those podcasts, they were quite close to when they were um, recorded. But, yeah, the... the the being posted uh, not all that long ago, but but then there was the delay of actually getting us to review the timeless children, and that is more of a result of um, having to cope with the current lockdown situation. Totally, yes. I think um, me myself, I've been doing more work than I would ordinarily have been doing. Um, so yeah, it's been hard. Not only are we in the middle of a lockdown, we're in the middle of a Doctor Who lockdown as well. Um, and I feel like I've been missing out on that a bit because I'm not um, isolating at home. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. Um, Have you been doing any of the um, the watch alongs, the the, t- the tweetathons? <laughs> uh, no, I haven't. Because uh, I think it started off as I mean, I, I was going to say I think it started off as quite a nice idea, which, which kind of suggests I think. But now it's turned into something bloody awful. But that's bad phrasing on my part. No, I think it started off you know quite well, but now it seems to be um, it seems to be. You know, pretty much every Doctor Who story now is just yeah. let's do a watch along, which is fair enough. I can see, you know, I just haven't had the time to do it. Yeah, it um, gets worse tomorrow. There's a double one. It's um, Stolen Earth, Stolen Earth, Journey's End tomorrow night. Nah, I think I'll, I'll I'll give that one a miss. I think, um, but I mean, it's 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 great. But um, because I'm working, f- uh, because I'm one of those fortunate enough. I'm I'm working from home, but um. I'm working flat out with what I'm uh, doing. Um, not wanting to go into too much detail, but um, it's because it's from an administrative side, but my job relates to uh, health research. So there's a lot of stuff coming in with COVID-19. Um, and I tell you what, I work with some incredible people, um, just uh, people working flat out to, to get these um, research proposals up to scratch and, and you know, to, to try and find um cures basically mm-hmm. um so yeah so so we went flat out at work and then because of when i finally switch off um and when i do watch a bit of television um i have it's been nothing doctor who related i, I have been doing a columbo what uh, i'm going through the episodes of columbo nice yeah which i'm really <laughs> which i'm really enjoying gotta love columbo um, didn't we talk about Columbo a while back? Wasn't there an episode full of Dick Van Dykes you were talking about? <laughs> yes, I must. Yeah, because there is an episode with Dick. Yes, there is. Uh, uh, I um, uh, I'm referring to the one you what, was set in the UK or something, set in London. Oh load of, no, loaded, do- loaded, stodgy looking actors. Yeah, no, no. Funny enough, because uh, Honor Blackman, um, famous for being in the Avengers and playing Pussy Galore and Goldfinger, sadly passed away recently. 
and no no um so she was in this episode of Columbo, which is set in london called dagger in the mind and my god is it atrocious it's really bad it's i can is see it how... so bad it's good or is it just bad no it's just bad um i could see how audience like american audiences in 1972 would have lapped it up because it, it's sort of like the the season's uh, novelty episode Columbo goes to london it's got all the english stereotypes but you've got english actors told to play the english stereotype and they really ham it up um I don't mind English stereotypes if it's done, you know, because sometimes they can be quite funny and if it's done with a bit of wit, but oh no, it's just hammy and awful. No, the one that Dick Van Dyke's in, uh, I've forgotten the title of it now, but he basically, he plays a photographer who commits a murder. Um, and memories, I haven't got to that episode yet, but my memories of it, it's, it's quite good. Yeah, but I think of the episodes that I've watched so far, Dagger in the Mind's the worst. It's, it's, it's awful. I don't think I've been watching any Doctor Who recently. I did watch um, The Timeless Children last night. Um, and finally, I've been watching Quiz. It's a three-part documentary about the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire winner. <laughs> yes, I remember. I saw that and I went... Because uh, for, for those who, who don't know, back in 2001, uh, the quiz show Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, there was um, a really stupid major, or former major, like the guy's unbelievably thick, got onto Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and somehow won the million pound jackpot. The reason the, the, how he won was because he made a deal with, uh, obviously with his wife who was in the audience and someone else that um, what they had this set up where if he was presented with a question to which he didn't know the answer, which was pretty much all of them, he would then go through all the answers and go is it A? Blah, 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 or is it or, or it could be C? Or and whichever there was the correct one, the guy in the audience would go, <coughs> <coughs> uh, uh, and so the cough would indicate that's the correct answer. This was back in two thousand and one, so now there's th this three-part drama that's just been made and broadcast about it. I thought, what the hell? Was it any good though? It actually was. I thought, or I, I was surprised it was more than one episode. I thought, God, didn't they just go on a show and cough? But no, <laughs> it was a lot more than that. <laughs> I it mean, I, suppo a, I suppose in today's sorry to interrupt, but I suppose in today's day and age, to have um, a program looking at coughing in quite the light-hearted way is <laughs> it's, it's nothing to do with the coronavirus, so it's light-hearted. Yeah, um, my advice would be to watch it. It's not a um, it's not a murder docudrama. It's just it is somewhat a bit light-hearted, and it's not um, biggest crime in the world. But of course, we don't really know the truth. Were they cheating or were they not? <laughs> Well, there's. I think one of the questions was, um, it was something to do with uh, which musician or band has released a particular album, and then he goes, I think I think he's left with two options because he's went for fifty fifty, and it's A one and Craig David, and then he goes, it's A one. I think it's definitely A one. Yeah, it's it's the band A one. And don't he says he's never heard of Craig David. Haven't heard of Craig David. His wife coughs. So it's like A1, it's definitely A1. A A1. It's, I've never heard of Craig David. <coughs> it's Craig David. <laughs> it's uncanny, yeah. Smoothly done. Yes. However did he get caught. Yeah. But there was, a, there was a bit of an underground network of fans getting on the show. Mm. Um, watch the documentary. Um, <laughs> it surprised me, um, Michael Sheen plays Chris Tarrant. Oh, I mean, he's, always, he's always good. Well, funny enough, because... Uh, it, it took a little while to click because the uh, the Graham Norton show show did this uh, the thing of who wants to be a millionaire type setup. But Martin Sheen was at his home. Graham Norton's in the studio, and his phone a phone a friend is um, Judy Dench, and has it just seemed a bit of a bizarre thing to do. But it was quite good fun. I thought Martin Sheen's doing a really good uh, impression of Chris Tarrant, and I took it. Oh yeah, because he's in that that drama thing where he plays Chris Tarrant. It kind of reminded me of the podcast because when they were editing the footage mm. for um, the police and in court, they kind of over-edited it and isolated the cough so you could hear them more. Um, it kind of rem reminded me of the podcast, like the opposite <laughs> of, what you, of what we do. Yeah. Well, do you remember, because this was all like big news back in 2001 when it happened, and then what they did was ITV... They basically did that. I think it was presented by Chris Tarrant. 
And he said, right, we're now finally going to show because it wasn't broadcast. I didn't know. I'm one of the I'm one of the Mandela effect people who think it happened. It was on air. No, no, it wasn't. A lot of um, people think they've seen it. Well, what happened? I've forgotten when the time scale of it was, but it may have been 2002. But at, at some point, what they did was they did actually show it, but um, not when it originally happened. And it was this special. So finally, you, the uh, the general public, can see. And what they did say was, but we have um, emphasised the coughs so you can hear them. It was, a, it was unintentionally comic. I've got this memory that of a bit where. Um, because we're just we're just told that it was just coughs through sig- uh, signals just by coughing, but I've got this memory that there was one time when he actually goes, <coughs> no, <laughs> just went, was it that blatant? Anyway, that's in my memory. I don't know whether that actually <laughs> happened because it was a all, all long time ago. But I've got a memory that happened and it just cracks me up. <laughs> Queen David. <laughs> Okay, great. <laughs> now that we, uh, so there's that tangent and catching up and whatnot. So now, on to the Timeless Children, uh, the final episode of Series 11. Uh, so a 12. First, is it 12? Right. Yes. <laughs> I had a feeling I got that wrong, but it's just like, well, if I'm not, I'll just go with it. Oh, okay, yes, the final episode of Season 12. You were just testing me, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, oh, it just reminds me of school, you know, just pointing out, I was just doing that to test you. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what I was doing. Great, and and, and you passed, Rob. I'm glad you're paying attention. So anyway, <laughs> cast and crew: uh, Bradley Walsh plays Graham, uh, Tosin Cole plays Ryan, Mandip Gill plays Yasmin, Sasha Dewan plays the Master. I've just realised that I've, I've missed Jodie Whittaker off this list. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, who plays the Doctor? Jeez. Uh, Patrick O'Kane plays Ashad. Ian McKinnery plays Co. Sharmus. Julie Graham plays uh, Ravio, Alex Austin plays Yad Lamy, Matt Carver plays Ethan, Ryan Clements plays Bescott, uh, Sillan Baxter plays uh, Tech Tayoon, Kirsty uh, Besterman plays Salpado, and of course Nicholas Briggs provides the Cyberman voices. So, just a quick plot synopsis. So, Gallifrey is dead. The Master is in control of an army of Cybermen ready to take over the universe. And Graham, Ryan and Yaz are trapped, being hunted down with the last remnants of humanity. But for the Doctor, one question remains. Who is the timeless child? Well, it's the Doctor, of course. And the Master creates a new cyber race, Cybermen, who can instantly regenerate. Uh, but they're all defeated and the episode ends. Um, so that's the, the plot synopsis that's, of that's the episode. That's the podcast over. <laughs> Thoughts, Rob? What did you think? <laughs> so it <are> coming. <laughs> Tune in next week, uh, where we have. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Um, so in the previous episode, uh, it was we had um, Graham and Yaz and a, a couple of um, th- some of the last remnants of, of humanity stuck on a ship, stuck in a room uh, with all the Cybermen approaching. And of course, we were, you know, we were going. How are they going to get out of it? And I thought we was like, well, let's hope it's an escape through a ventilation shaft yes. because that well, has my, been... my guess was maybe they're actually in a different room. Oh yes, you did say that, and uh... I was a bit disappointed. Yeah, yeah, I was about just... the bust into an empty room. <laughs> yeah, it's just like they're the one. They're in the room next door. You muppets. Um, oh, <laughs> yes, the... they're out in the corridor, going up the other other door. That would be great. <laughs> They missed a trick. I wish they did that. Um, Because actually, I think one of the... uh, I do think this episode lacks a bit of humour and that would have been quite welcomed. But no, they they escape in uh, an air vent, which actually I thought, you know, it's typical Doctor Who. We haven't seen that in a while. So it's escape in the air vent. Yay! One of them dies, though. (laughs) Oh yeah, You have to forgive me. um, I don't remember a lot of the extras' names. It's not important. Yeah. Uh, it's just uh, yeah, I'm sort of the same. Even though I just read them off some some of them off the cast list, it's just from this point on they're just going to be you know some of the humans. Uh, so yeah, one of the one of the humans dies. Yeah, and then uh, so, yeah, so great. So then we crack on. Great, <laughs> <laughs> great. So uh, they all escape, and that's absolutely um, fine and dandy. And then um, 
the the doctor has joined the master on gallifrey so for some of this episode uh we cut between what's you know what the doctor and the master are doing and what the humans and uh and the companions are doing with obviously the uh the humans and the companions uh trying to defeat the cybermen and the doctor with the master trying to ascertain like why did the master destroy gallifrey What's this big secret that he uh, supposed to has, which will change everything? And the master seems to be going about when when the doctor finds out what this truth is, it will destroy her. And he seems to have some other sort of plan going on, but we don't know what that is yet in this episode. But what ends up happening is, in we end up having sort of this. Um, I don't know how to sort of this. It has to be explained narratively, but we also have a bit of a continuity dump at this point. Now, I think in terms of what has to be conveyed, it's done quite economically in the dialogue. So I think Chris Chibnall does quite a good job of doing it. It, it doesn't feel like it, it's too waffly. And I think Sasha Dewan, as the master, who's a, who's a really good actor anyway and plays the part superbly well, does this sort of this continuity dump quite well in his performance. But having said that, I think there's an awful lot to take in. Uh, the Time Lords have to be explained. The Doctor, the history between the Doctor and the Master is explained, and the Matrix Matrix has to be explained. Now, for fans such as us, you know, we know who the Time Lords are, we know the the history of the Doctor and the Master, and we know what the Matrix is, so that's fine. And in order for the story to, to make sense, these things would have to be explained to you know general viewers or non-fans who may be tuning in. But I actually think that this, the fact that, you know, we've got these things and we've got this story which centers around these elements, I think this causes a bit of a problem because even though I said that actually, you know, these are, they were, they were explained quite well in quite, uh, quite an economic way. You get all the information that you need in, you know, a quick short burst. Having said that though, it's still an awful lot of information to take in, don't you think? I guess so. I'd never really thought about it like that. Um, I'm always very critical of how uh, a lot of information that depends on this foreknowledge um, comes across to viewers. Mm -hmm. Um, But it didn't occur to me in this case. Um, Like you said, it is is explained to an extent. Yeah. Um, Whether or not that feels a bit rushed to new viewers, I'm not sure. That's an interesting one. I'd like to to know what people's feelings on that. Yeah, very much so. It's... um... I would like, yeah, it'd be sort of interesting if we got uh, just a, uh, if someone who didn't know the history of of the show and was just watching it as a general drama, what they thought of it. Um, but before before I go on, because obviously this is all set on Gallifrey and the Doctor was a Time Lord from Gallifrey, and that this is this is a big deal when, um, oh, so, so we thought, but yeah, we'll, we'll get onto that later. Um, just in general, Rob, what what's your sort of take on on stories or moments when the Doctor goes to Gallifrey? Do do you like that? Do you think it works? I do like it because it's something I look forward to, um, and there's always a a bit of disconnect between between the last and the next, and there's always a a leap of imagination. You have to you have to try and join the dots because, especially with the in the modern era, we have Dave the Doctor, then we have Hellbent. And now we're here, which is um, three radical different steps. Um, yeah. I always expect more, possibly. Um, or um, I want something a bit more grounded. Um, we, a Gallifrey is always coming or going. It's mm-hmm. never a constant. And I find that a bit frustrating. Either get rid of it or keep it. And none of this um, back and forward. I'm not really a fan of. Yeah, that's true, actually. I, I do find that uh, a bit frustrating. Just out of curiosity, because uh, you know th- we've seen Gallifrey in classic Doctor Who, of course, as well as the new series. Yeah. In terms of the stories when we have seen Gallifrey, which is your which is your favourite? Possibly um, Invasion of Time, or in a different way, I kind of like the aesthetics of the Five Doctors. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I guess I I could go with the. Um, the kind of um, yeah, like the invasion of time kind of aesthetic, yeah, yeah, the deadly assassin invasion of time yeah. type type look, yeah, I do think that's probably the best, and I think 
See, because sometimes I wonder, you know, because G Gallifrey conveys that, you know, this, this, it, there's a lot of weighty expectation when it comes to, you know, the, Gallifrey's back in some form of the Doctor's visiting Gallifrey or whatever. So there's a lot of weighty expect, uh, expectation. And it could be argued, well, it doesn't matter what, it, it, it doesn't matter what the story can do. It can only, um, it can only be disappointing compared to your expectations. Because I think it yeah. could be argued that, um, with the odd exception, when the Doctor has gone to Gallifrey, the story has been a bit disappointing for one reason or another. Um, and I, I may not necessarily hold that opinion myself, um, but I know that you know some some people find the way that Gallifrey is portrayed in the, in the series uh, can be a bit sort of disappointing. Um, I like the I like the invasion of time. I think that that works. Um, the Five Doctors certainly, um, and I think it suits that story because it was a big celebratory story and it makes sense. You know, we were on Gallifrey and da 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 and all the rest of it. I think the new series, I'm not too sure. But anyway, um, so we're on Gallifrey here and everything is in, is, is in ruins because of what the, the Master has, has done. And I quite like the design and the cinematography and the look that is achieved uh, in this episode. Um, so that, you know, that's good. And we get some good interaction between the Doctor and the Master at this point. And then, of course, we then cut to... Um, uh, Graham and Yaz, who are trying to escape the Cybermen with uh, a couple of the other um, un unnamed humans. They are named, we just can't remember them. Um, and at this point, what they do is, I actually really like this this moment, is the Graham comes up with this idea of going, look, uh, we've got these um, uh, de decommissioned Cybermen, why don't we just uh, hide inside the cyber suits? And of course, They've got human remains inside, but we because uh, Ashan is still on the uh, sorry Ashad is still on the the warpath looking looking for them, yes. and there's this brilliant moment you know when you've got all of them hiding in the the cyber suits, and you got Ashad looking for them and coming very close, and I thought that was I thought that was inc you know that was very tense. Um, I like that. Probably quite terrifying to some people. Yeah, uh, there's you know you get the real sense of of, of threat. Um, it was a very radical um, but desperate idea of hiding in the Cybermen and it, we get this very graphic line of um, the full of human r remains and that young lad um, she says um, Are you, you take the body parts out <laughs> it's very graphic yeah and I think that was a good scene because it was graphic in terms of the dialogue but not necessarily what we see mm -hmm. uh, which is you know I think I think it was handled quite well but it's that moment when you know We've got close-up of eyes. Um, uh, Yaz is is, is tearful because she's quite apprehensive, which is a total, totally normal um, reaction to have. I thought mm -hmm. that was great, and because uh, in our previous podcast, you know, uh, previous two podcasts, you know, when we were talking about uh, Ashad, you know, we really, you know, um, liked his character in the sense of, you know, he is a real threat. Um, Mm -hmm. And like you said, Yaz was crying inside the, the cyber suit. And they're kind of on new ground here because they're not with the Doctor. And they've probably been in similar situations before. Mm -hmm. um, but the Doctor probably provides a false sense of security a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe the danger feels a bit more real now. Yeah, they're, that's they're true. And actually following on from that point, because there were there were a couple of nice scenes in these early moments, uh, between Graham and Yaz, you know, um, you know, keeping their confidence levels up. And in fact, mm. there's a lovely little scene, you know, where they're just having a chat, and Graham, you know, opens up and goes, you know, I think you're incredibly brave, and you're doing, you know, absolutely brilliantly. And I thought that was a that was a really nice, touching scene, very well performed. Um, yeah. And it, but it wasn't it wasn't sort of saccharine because you got that that nice balance of of you know of character characters relating to one another mm -hmm. um emotion and and, and humor uh, you know yeah yes basically you know uh graham eulogizing how he thinks yes is just fantastic and she just comes out with you know you're not a bad human yourself it's like yeah. is that all you got so you know it was it was quite comedic as well as as well as being quite touching i, I thought that was uh, i thought that was quite nice yeah 
but probably quite realistic. I mean, how would you react caught off guard if yes. you're not a very open person? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, um, and then providing sort of the the action um, moments in this episode, we then we then see uh, a battle with the Cybermen because at this point um, uh, we have uh, another human and. Koshamas, and they're ba uh, they're battling uh, a group of Cybermen, um, and I thought it was handled quite well. I think if I'm going to be a bit critical of that, I thought it lacked a bit. I thought it lacked a little bit of the pace and excitement needed to sell that moment. It felt a bit sort of perfunctionary. I don't know whether. Mm, yeah, it wasn't the most memorable part of the story. Yeah, I thought you know for, for for that thing. I mean, it's um it's a relatively uh, short part short uh, uh, short part of the episode, but uh for for it to be act you know the action moment, I thought uh, it could have been sort of a bit more fast paced, a little bit faster editing, a bit more or a bit more tense because of course there was strat strategy to the attack as well, wasn't there? Yes, yeah, yeah, and I think because uh, there's a lot of long shots. Uh, in that, which you know, considering that they're in the, the the massive open countryside, and you've got maybe ten Cybermen in a you know in a mm -hmm. in a squadron, it it sort of it didn't have the impact I think. Mm -hmm. But you know, it was it was fine. It wasn't poor. I just thought it it needed a bit more punch. However, the bit that I did like about that is I thought that Ryan was great in that bit. He's he, you know he's quite funny because he, he basically has a sort of like a it looks like a basketball, but it's a bomb, and he throws that at a group of Cybermen, and they blow up. And yeah. the way he reacts, I thought I thought that was quite funny. And that goes back to Spyfall Part One, doesn't it? When he was yes. playing basketball, and it's mm -hmm. all kind of come full circle from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought, you know, t uh, I thought Justin Cole played. I mean, he plays Ryan very well, but I thought, you know, he he was great in that scene. Um, you know, because there's the the, the the tense sort of build up and the excitement, and then that sort of humorous relief. Uh, mm -hmm. and release before then oh crap there's more Cybermen coming um, but again I just feel that the direction at that point um, didn't help sell his performance as well as it could he was great mm -hmm. but again I just thought it was you know perfectly fine but I just thought that was a, a moment in the episode which could have been executed a little bit better um, um, so then um, following this this, uh, this battle um Ryan is then uh, reunited with uh with um Graham and Yaz and that's quite a, a nice little scene and then what happens is they because the master has then invited the Cybermen onto Gallifrey so the Cybermen are then on Gallifrey so then um the companions and the humans then arrive on Gallifrey trying to look for the doctor and so now we have these moments because at this point um, the doctor is stuck in the matrix. Uh, but I'm holding back on that. We'll we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. Fair so enough. The, yeah. Um, so the, the the doctor's in the matrix finding stuff out. Um, and at, and at this point the master is talking to Shad. And I thought this is when I think the episode takes a bit of a turn I'm not keen on but it starts off quite well so we have uh, the master uh, and Ashad sort of um, interacting and having a conversation and what I really like about this is you know it's more to do with how Sasha Dewan plays it rather than through dialogue mm -hmm. but we find out what we're seeing is the way that the, the master is behaving and sort of he's he's asking these prompting questions we see he's trying to find out what Ash, uh, Ashad's plans are and we're seeing the master scheme and you know you, you can see through Sasha Dewan's performance you know through his eyes you can see the the, the wheels turning and what the you know see oh, the master's thinking and something you know something's going on um I just thought that was a really good performance and it's sort of a really good um reaction between these two Mm -hmm. What I don't like is 
what then happens because we've always because uh, in previous podcasts we've said and i don't think we're the only people who have said this i think a lot of people have said that they quite like a shad and the reason being is because he is a cyberman who is a threat he is you know he is uh he's evil he relishes in uh, in pain you know we had some we've had some really dramatic powerful uh interact you know with the doctor uh, with ashad interacting with the doctors and uh, with the doctor and others and i thought you know he could be a really good strong reoccurring villain but no he's killed by the master um and yeah, I was, we, didn't, we didn't really get to explore the new dynamics it brings no and i've got to say i was disappointed with that the the way that it's sort of handled within the, the episode is fine it's just the idea of the master killing him in the first place, and now that fantastic villain is no more. That's why I don't like it. I'm a bit disappointed because I thought, um, for the first time in ages, we've got a you know we've got a villain who poses a real threat, and mm. having him pop up now and again, I thought we you know could provide some really interesting stories. So I just feel it it feels a bit it's, it's an opportunity wasted. I feel um, so. I was a bit disappointed. Do you agree with that? Or not? I do agree, but it didn't bother me so much. Mm. Um, it's a bit frustrating. We get the lone Cyberman, and he was just a stepping stone of getting back to the Master. Um, but you know, it didn't bother me so much. There was more to explore there, you're right. But m- maybe we'll get to see him younger at some point. I seriously doubt it. No, Yeah, I doubt it as well. But yeah, maybe. And maybe it opens a potential for further Cyberman development and how they appear in the series later on so the idea of an uh, uh, the idea of an ashad you know could pop up again but as a yeah i think you're right in terms of the episode itself it didn't bother me but i, I i'm more i'm more irri- i don't know whether irritated is the right word i think i'll stick with disappointed I, i'm more disappointed as i said because i feel that it's it's a, a, what there was an opportunity for the series which i thought was really strong and it's mm. just been wasted a bit um but I did like, um, I, I, you know, again, it, a little bit of humor injected, you know, where, where we see the master, because he, he kills Ashad using the tissue compression eliminator. And then after he's done that, wishing he'd said, I'm going to cut you down to size. And being frustrated, he didn't, you know, sort of like do that pun. Um, I thought that was quite a nice touch. I like that. What's interesting is in, that, in this point is because we've got this... Um, I've forgotten the name of it, but it's essentially it's a, an incredibly powerful bomb um, that was stuck in the, the chest unit of Ashad. It seems to be that when the Master killed him, he wanted the bomb to go off. Uh, yeah, so maybe he obviously he thought there was a chance it could have went off. There's always a 50 50 chance he could gamble. Yeah, um, so. And I guess he, he does like that, much like the final scene that mm-hmm. we'll get into later. There was a chance um, of either succeeding or not. Um, yeah, maybe but I mean, maybe that's where he gets his thrill from, you know. Yeah, but I mean, does he have a death wish or? The Doctor is forced into because this is the the sort of the, the big thing of the episode. There's this, mm-hmm. you know, it was hinted at in the Ghost Monument. This thing about the timeless child. Yes. Uh, but then that was never mentioned again until series twelve, with a you know reference, and I think about five episodes or something like that so this was the thing it was building up to what on earth is the timeless child so the doctor's been forced into the matrix by the master and during some you know some scenes um the history of gallifrey is shown so it turns out that the shabogans which i think is a great name uh were the was the was the shabogans um feature was that name used all the way back in um i know invasion of time you know what it may i'm not 100 percent sure but now that you mentioned it that's a possible possibly because you know we're aware of the um the gallifrey and natives live outside of the capital yeah and and leela befriends them yeah were they Shiboga? It rings a bell now that you mention it. It's been mm-hmm. ages since I've watched that story, and I think it's a lot better than its reputation. I- I'd like us to, to go back and watch that at some point. Yeah, let's do that soon. But um, so, turns out that the Shibogans were the original indigenous species of Gallifrey, and one of them was called um, Tecteun. 
<laughs> keep on forgetting the uh, right, who was a space explorer and was the first to leave Gallifrey and spent um, an untold amount of time exploring, searching the stars, and exploring she... um, different galaxies as well. Yeah. Yes. So... Yeah. Yeah. So eventually, she finds a lone child left abandoned, who is revealed to be able to regenerate, and this is the timeless child. Mm -hmm. And the timeless child is from a species from another reality or dimension. Um, she found the child beneath a boundary. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. And is is it the same visual as the boundary? I don't think it is. Um, I think there is a little bit of similarity, but it's not the obviously it's not the same boundary. I just had this. Um, little thing in my head, you know, um, we don't know how the boundary behaves, mm. um, but um, we did speculate that perhaps the boundary connects to the person who approaches it, and it opened to Gallifrey because the doctor was there. My um, little theory was, if Tecteun had approached this boundary, what if it had opened to Gallifrey at a different time, and the child is a time lord from the future? Oh my god! <laughs> that's oh, that's yeah, that's yeah. really interesting. Oh, that's I really like that idea, Rob. So for our we'll just, yes, yeah, 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 we'll just say. I mean, or oh, what if it gets worse and this child is a future incarnation of the Doctor? Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> mm. Oh, Stephen Moffat wishes with oh. these ideas. <laughs> He wants to write for the show again. Oh, bloody hell. Mine's blown. Uh, um, so I have a few um, questions about the child um, at this stage. Mm. Um, we know that Tectium is a native Gallifreyan. Yep. We don't know... I guess you know the answer to this, but the Shabogans, do they have two hearts? Was the child anatomically identical to Tectium with two hearts? I wonder. Or was the two hearts a, a result of the, of the gene spicing? None of the uh, interesting questions. Uh, don't know. Um, it could be overlooked because basically every life form in the universe is humanoid anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, I mean, it's it's possible. I mean, it, nothing was mentioned. So at the moment, it's um, it's it's open to speculation. Uh, I think those are good questions. And um, because I think, I think it was in Praxius, you know, there was that line... That at the time could have been deemed as like a sort of like a throwaway joke, you know. But it was this idea that the Doctor had more than one brain. Mm -hmm. But I think I've forgotten what the line was. But there's a line in this episode. I think it's, it's I think it's said by the Master. Yes, when he says the the remnant remnant of the Matrix resides in this brain in these brains or something. Or yeah, something, something like that. So yeah. I think I think now it's established that right. Okay, so. They have at least two brains, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and and then maybe that you know if they've got two hearts and two brains, maybe that sort of answers the question of going well. Maybe it is to do with the DNA splicing. The brain thing, though, I don't take it as a literal sense. I take it as more of a, a higher dimensional thing because if the if the time lords are more time sensitive, their brain is on a, a whole other plane, um, to ours. Yeah, living, but it would still be like a linear time. But it would still be one brain. Yeah, we're two minds about it. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so with this timeless child, so from a species, another reality or dimension has the ability to regenerate indefinitely and continuously change their appearance. So because of Tectoon's research, the DNA, as we said, is, is is placed into the Shabogan's DNA, and this creates the Time Lords. Hmm. Interesting. And then, of course, it is, is established that the timeless child itself is the Doctor. So, uh, this is quite a significant um, thing, which, you know, to, suddenly there's this whole new mythos and history of the Doctor that has been set up. Well, it was set up earlier in the series, but, you know, it's, it's, it's explained fully here now. It's everything we're feared because we know it's just going to be a bit of a headache. Yes. So, Rob, uh, what are your thoughts? My thoughts on the on this whole situation, I'm kind of fine with it. It's a complete radical shake-up. It doesn't contradict a great deal, as far as I'm aware of. Mm. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. 
yeah, um, and I'm kind of fine with it. I mean, if you if you've got a problem with it because you simply don't want it to be, um, I guess that's just a personal thing. But um, I think narratively it's quite good. It it kind of devalues the Time Lords in my mind, um, because they are some. They've got such rich history, and you can kind of hold them in kind of a higher regard than the Doctor almost, because she's she's the offspring of the Time Lords. Um, and looking back at Rassilon and the Five Doctors, the irony of them, Rassilon sat in the, laying in the Dark Tower, um, threatening the Doctor with immortality, when she, he was the immortal. The Doctor was the immortal, and Rassilon had a had a cap on his lives you know <laughs> yeah but the fact that they were able to offer the master more lives sort of make because that was always regarded as a continuity error um sort of makes sense now so you mm. you could argue that so but okay so but basically if someone was to say right rob do you like this idea of the timeless child or not yes or no what would you say <sighs> it makes me feel uneasy but I'll roll with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've mean, got no choice, I suppose. I think um, my feelings of it are, I think it's like, I agree with you what you're saying. It doesn't, it doesn't change things that massively, even though it's, it, so Chris Triplin's actually done this quite amazing thing. He's done something really significant, but at the same time, uh, it doesn't affect the sort of the continuity of the show too much. No. It, I mean, it does raise questions and it does make things a bit sort of slightly confusing, but in but in many respects. So it sort of suggests that Joe Martin was one of it, who still calls herself the Doctor. Yes. And one of the one of the problems I think people have is if, if that the fact that she's a pre the Hartnell Doctor, she has a police box, mm -hmm. which at face value, that goes against what we know about. Um, the pilot episode how in that instance the TARDIS that the Doctor stole um, when they leave it is still a police box Yeah, I don't have a problem with the fact that this could have happened before and perhaps it's the very same TARDIS yeah I mean so I mean mm. you still pick holes and you know you can give yourself a brain ache looking at this sort of thing but it's still I think in terms of the Doctor that we know and the sort of thing, you know, it, it begins with William Hartnell, so that still mm. hasn't that still hasn't been altered. So okay, that's mm. quite handy. The problem that I have with it, and I, don't get me wrong, because I agree with you, it's sort of like I'm sort of a bit. In, if truth be told, I'm sort of indifferent about it, um, mm. and it's like, well, let's just roll with it, and <laughs> as if we've got a choice. Um, but yeah, let's just roll with it. And to be perfectly honest, do I think it'll be picked up in the show again? It might be. Do I want it to be? Don't know. Um, the, the only thing that that bothers me about it, even though largely I'm sort of indifferent, is the importance it suddenly places on the Doctor in relation to the Time Lords. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, the Doctor is this hugely significant person in Time Lord history. Yeah. Um, which I always, I always much preferred this idea that you know, you got the Time Lords, and you had this one person, the Doctor, uh, who was just sort of just a regular Time Lord, and then just rebelled. I quite liked that sort of that that simplicity. The Doctor was just a normal Time Lord, and then rebelled, and then just nicked a TARDIS, yeah, and travelled around out of interest and started writing wrongs. I quite like that. But yeah, now it's, that... it's this liberating idea, like breaking from conformity, yeah, and just going off and d making your own rules. Right and right and wrongs and stuff, yeah. Yeah, you've summed it up brilliantly there. Brilli yeah, it's exactly that. Uh, and that was something that continued, you know, it was there from William Hartnell's Doctor all the way through even to the, the modern era. I liked that. But now suddenly there's this huge weight of importance that suddenly just landed on the Doctor. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's the one thing I'm not keen on. But mm -hmm. And it does kind of belittle the Time Lords now in our minds. Will they ever... Will we ever hold them in the same regard? Will the well, Doctor even um, think of herself as a Time Lord now? Well, it's sort of interesting. I mean, there's, I mean, certainly from the Deadly Assassin onwards, but there's always been this thing of of the Time Lords. They've always been a bit shady, and a mm. bit, um, you know. And it sort of it made sense why the Doctor would rebel against this really 
stuffy, hypocritical, um, conformist society. Um, so you could actually argue, well, what they, you know, th what they became because of the timeless child and the lies that they spun following on from that it shows you know that it, it sort of just emphasizes that element of the time lords um how do you feel about this in relation to the master now if the master is simply a time lord he's not on the same level as the doctor i always prescribed the idea that the master could be the doctor's brother because i always thought the the very equal not in um in obvious respect um but um, they're always they're rivals, you know, they're, they're, they're opposites. Sorry, mm -hmm. not equal. So now, if the master is doesn't have the same origin of the doctor, does that kind of belittle the master in a way? Yeah, I think a little bit because yes, I agree with you in the sense that I always thought that what was really good about uh, the relationship between the doctor and the master was that they were. Um, I didn't. I mean, I wouldn't be bothered if it had if they had gone down this route of, of explaining that they had, you know, that they that they were brothers, but um, or siblings. But uh, I like the idea that they had once been friends, and actually, what now divide because they're both of equal intelligence and ability. And in fact, actually, in some instances, it's sort of that it's it's even been you know heavily suggested that actually the, the master is the most intelligent and you know more capable, and there was that sort of that that rivalry. But what? what was the difference between them which is emphasized in the john Pertwee story colony in spaces it's 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 a battle of psychological views you know the the you know the master's all about you know power and control and that's the meaning of existence you know to to, to dominate whereas the master goes whereas the doctor goes no it's it's the complete opposite of that and it's 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 to learn and develop and improve um that's what I sort of like, but yeah, but now that again, so yeah, now that there's this huge importance placed on the doctor, it yeah, I, I do think it has it has affected. Yeah, I think can I, I throw a little curveball in now? Yeah, yeah, go on. Okay, so we see the Citadel develop in mm. stop motion. It's a very cool shot. Um, we see yeah, the, yeah, Shibogan, the Shibogans develop, um, discover the ability of time travel. Um, um, Tech Tune helped the the ruling elite um, become Time Lords with the uh, regeneration, but Tech Toon imposed the limit. Um, could we, assume, we could probably assume that Tech Toon is an immortal and might still be around right now. That is a po Yeah, possibly, yeah. The, I'm guessing this might have been concealed from the Time Lords. Uh, who knows? Um, yeah, so is Tech Toon, Tech Toon immortal? Um, I, I think we might find out and I've got a question here. Could the master be Tectoon? There is a little bit of slight evidence that could support this. The Cybermen are converted. The, well, the, the Time Lords are converted into Cybermen. Mm -hmm. But the, the 12 regeneration limit has been removed, seemingly. I think the master says this and, and the doctor says this, that they can, um, they can regenerate indefinitely if the master was Tectoon. Um, subconsciously you might know how to remove the limit and with regards to the master um, the master's long past his 13th life mm -hmm. uh, there's been different interpretations of the master staying alive by will alone or by um, stealing other people's lives and bodies um, trying to steal the doctor's lives mm -hmm. um, but maybe the master was immortal this whole time yeah I mean it's interesting it's possible I don't think I would want the, the uh... I don't think I would want the the master to be revealed to Tech Two because then that would yeah. mean the, the master, doctor's mother. <laughs> yeah, the doctor's mother, and it's just oh for God's sake, really. Even even a soap opera would sort of cringe at that <laughs> idea. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I mean it's a possibility, but I, I sincerely hope. <laughs> it's, personally, I wouldn't want the series to go down that route. <laughs> so just a little theory there, based on a couple of um, observations. <laughs> mm -hmm. But no, no, it's uh, in, you know interesting. And yeah, maybe there is, but yeah, I think this raises another problem because then if you if you want to sort of like reestablish the level playing field between the Doctor and the Master, you would then have to place something of equal or slightly greater importance on the Master, mm -hmm. and then I think you know you you could be going down a, a route of potential silliness. Um, but as it presently is, as I said, it's sort of I'm not really 
fussed about it. It is what it is. It doesn't really affect the show that significantly. Mm. Um, but as I said, it just I, I just don't like the idea of the, the importance that the Doctor suddenly has in, in Time Lord history. I, mm. I much prefer that simple approach that we talked about before. But, yeah, you know, it is what it is. But then something else is explained in relation to, to what we said. So when we were reviewing the previous episode, um, there was, you know, we had this seemingly random setting of 1920s, I think, uh, Ireland. And we had this Irish policeman, Brendan, uh, and it, it seemed to be following quite a normal, you know, Brendan is abandoned as a child, is suddenly, uh, suddenly, uh, you know, is, is then adopted by um, by surrogate parents, um, works for the police force, does really well, doesn't seem to be able to die, and then has his memory wiped. And like, oh, this is all very peculiar. It doesn't seem to have any bearing of the narratively on the story. Although I quite liked it. I think we both did. Uh, but as we both said when we reviewed that episode, is we like it, but of course it all very much depends on how that is explained in The Timeless Children. Uh, and it is explained. Um, it's a shame. I think we drew a connection to the Cybermen, didn't we? We thought it could have been the lone Cyberman's mm -hmm. past life or a Cyberman's um, unconscious dreams. Yeah. Because the Cybermen were screaming when um, the lone Cybermen was, um, was doing something to them. It turned out to be the fact that he was removing the, the biological components. Um, but we, we kind of saw a little correlation there, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, we did. Uh, Which um, might have made more sense. But, but yeah, so as it turns out, so the Doctor's memories... So it's explained that you had this thing called the Division, which is this sort of shady secret service. Because uh, the idea is the Time Lords... You know, fans will know this. The idea is that Time Lords do not intervene in other with other planets no but we got this thing called the division which basically goes that's the sort of rule but you know sometimes we might have to intervene for you know for our own benefit so we got this thing called the division yeah and the time lords have done this over the years that we have the celestial mm. intervention intervention agency yeah um I which sort of was that was that started by town sticks possibly i know it's been um yeah i think so used yeah. heavily in the bbc books and with big finish as well yeah yeah um, but maybe the division's a bit of a precursor to that. Although it does make me wonder why just why didn't Chris Chublin just say it was the CIA? But okay, but you got this thing called the division, and it turns out that Tectoon and the Doctor before she became the before he became the Doctor um, worked for the division. Um, but when but then what ends up happening is that for whatever reason we don't know why it's decided that whoever will become the Doctor, um, the, the Doctor is to stop working for the Division. So the Doctor has the memories of that wiped, completely erased, prior to the childhood that she remembers, with only snippets remaining. And it's those snippets which are masked as the story of the Irish policeman Brendan. Why not? <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and it's explained that this was a clue left by uh, Tectoon, that the secret service carried out by the doctor and the previous life was erased so it's sort of brendan's that that thing of the irish policeman brendan the whole thing is a sort of metaphor for the timeless child so you have this child who was seemingly abandoned entered the police force did sterling service but at the end of it had the memory wiped so obviously the timeless child was abandoned eventually works for the division has their memory wiped mm -hmm. So that's how it's explained. Um, Isn't it a bit strange that if you, they want to mask something hmm. with a, a different um, interpretation of the events, why would they pick something from Earth history <laughs> on Gallifrey? <laughs> hmm. Why not? It just stands out a bit. <laughs> it does a bit. Um, it, it does sort of like <laughs> it does sort of draw draw attention to it a bit more. Um, <laughs> I mean, it it's sort of. I mean, you can see how the story works, and you go, "Well, it sort of makes sense," but yeah, at the same time, of going, "But, eh, but, but, but why?" 
my problem is we've wasted half of the last episode with some good intrigue and mystery. Mm. And it's something that we could have done without, as it would turn out. We could have had a bit of throwaway dialogue or just not had that at all. Or they could have just said, but some of this was uh, was um, redacted. They could have just said that. <laughs> it could have saved us most of last episode. <laughs> yes. Um, so... It sort of narratively, you know, it sort of makes sense, but at the same time, yes, it, what it means, therefore, is some of our, in many respects, it's sort of padding, really, from the, you know, the previous episode, and and filler. also, th- come on, it's filler. Well, yeah, it's filler, Simmons. yeah. yeah um, it's you know, it, it took up pretty much half the episode, as you said, and then, and then it's also, it, and then it's explained very briefly within, because I remember the first time I watched this episode, I didn't when when that happened because it is sort of like compared to what else the episode contains blink and you miss it i went eh i didn't what i I didn't fully get it it was only on second viewing i went oh right yeah it was a bit um i mean unless one day we'll we'll meet the real brendan um who maybe tech tune and the doctor had met on their various adventures um and she used this real life person reinterpreted it as a memory mm-hmm. I don't know <laughs> I don't know that, that, would, that would maybe um, justify the whole thing I don't know let's yeah. just not, not revisit it I don't know. <laughs> not just, yeah just move on, it move was, on. It, I, was, I was a bit dis- sort of like a bit disappointed with it uh, that was the way that it went but you know um, and then the so the the doctor is is trapped in the matrix mm-hmm. and encounters uh joe uh, joe martin's doctor mm-hmm. uh and of course so what this means is that there, there are vast um uh versions of the doctor which we haven't seen before mm-hmm. so pretty much everything is canon yes um, i i think i did a I did a rough count when it was broadcast i may be wrong but i think we'll see 31 doctors in this episode Right. Okay. Um, which is a hell of a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It, this is this is including the, all the flashbacks that we see in that scene. Yeah. Well, I was just about to go on to that, but uh, just before. So what this means is, as far as I'm concerned, when I was a kid playing the Doctor, that's all canon. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That that's canon now. Me as the Doctor, when I was a kid, that's now canon. Uh, which which means for the uh, for the dear or. Uh, dear audiences listening to this i was once the doctor yes. but uh just regard them as missing adventures because you can't watch them some no. of them were bloody good <laughs> but, uh, but yeah but anyway yes so um we have that scene which is because by i think by a really peculiar line of dialogue so uh, the doctor's trapped in the matrix and has been uh, sort of like it's worked out that in order to escape the matrix has to sort of like blow it with her own mind and she can do mm. this by using all these memories that she has uh and, and says nothing ventured you know what well, she says she goes as they say nothing ventured nothing blown N- nothing blown yeah and great going, uh, um what no one says <laughs> yeah. that uh and also that's a really crap line i'm yeah. sorry sticks out like a mile i think she it's... says she's um she's done this before denied denied this reality is she re- referring to the ultimate foe? Uh, the deadly assassin and the ultimate foe, I think, yeah. Right, okay. Um, so, yeah. So, we have this really strange moment where... So, nothing ventured, nothing blowing. Shit line! <coughs> and then... Um, well, do you want to explain what happens? Well, the, the theme tune starts, for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it does, yes. Well, everything happens. We get a flashback. <laughs> We get a flashback of everything. I think I was playing and pausing it on the TiVo box for about five minutes or more, just <laughs> all the frames. Yeah. Um, so, so every basi- single basi- episode she, gets she clipped, runs through yeah. everything. Um, the the most noteworthy part, um, of course, would be the old Doctors, more specifically the Morbius Doctors. Um, now, this is something that I think we've just accepted as being ambiguous over the years, kind of regardless of what Hinchcliffe 
uh, Robert Holmes and Terran Dick's intentions were at the time. I think they intended that these were past doctors. But, you know, if something isn't definitely or definitively established on screen, mm -hmm. then all we can do is take it at face value. Mm -hmm. um, but now we have this, and it's kind of established that as canon. So these, these Morbius doctors were past doctors. Yeah, so Robert Holmes was the doctor. Philip yeah. Hinchcliffe was the doctor. We met the Hinchcliffe doctor. In the yes. We've got, we've got another photo of another doctor all of a sudden. Oh yeah, bloody hell, yeah. Uh, we'll have, so I met Philip Hinchcliffe. So not only, was, not only did he produce the show, he was also a star of the show. That's quite amazing. Uh, yeah. Um, so fantastic. Um, what did you... <laughs> so... So yeah, so they so basically the entire history of the show is is clipped around uh, Jodie Whittaker's head, as um, as we hear the Doctor Who theme, uh, and then blows herself out of the Matrix because nothing ventured, nothing blown. <laughs> <coughs> Shit line. <laughs> um, what what did you think? Say what you want about the theme tune. <laughs> I did kind of love its place. <laughs> I sort of I, I like it, but I don't. I like it for how just unsubtle and ridiculous it is when in the past when the show has used you know clips of its own history it felt you know it was just a, it was just a little sort of like a, a, a little bit of moment in the story and you know it felt you know felt a bit exciting and it, it sort of you know well a there, little was bit of there was, there was, there was times when it felt more justified like uh, earth shock or something you know yeah, you yeah. see all the, all the all the past doctors and then um, but in in more in recent years in the modern era, we get it all too often. A quick recap of some of the some get some stock footage and or a highlight of each doctor. It's it's become too much of a common thing, I think. Yeah, um, but it, it, it's it, become it, a hallmark of the show. Eventually, will there'll be a, a quick flash of all the doctors on screen, and we'll go yay. <laughs> Yeah, but I, th I think you're right because that was sort of what I was getting at. I think in the past it sort of like narratively worked, or it felt like the show had earned earned something, and it was a little bit of fun, a little bit of excitement for the fans. You know, you know when it was used in the eleventh hour, the first Matt Smith episode, uh, and you know you see, you know, a clip of all the past Doctors. Um, that was quite nice, and obviously it worked in the fiftieth anniversary special because it was the fiftieth anniversary. Mm -hmm. Um. Here, on the other hand, I th <laughs> I just think it looked a p I mean, I thought it was a bit ridiculous the way it was done. It looked a bit crass and it didn't look great. I think the way it was framed, um, mm. I can't take it seriously. As I, as I say, I think it l the way it was, the way it looked, I didn't think it looked great, but I'm kind of fine for it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, um, it was, yeah. It, it's it's there and it's distinctive. Mm -hmm. um, Who knew we would get here? Because l the last series, series eleven, mm. it really felt like Chibnall had drew a line, um, something um, Stephen Moffat hadn't done. I think thematically he drew a line, or um, there was some kind of styles there. But with Chibnall, I feel like he drew a line to have the show less reference heavy and. Um, just get on with some lots of standalone stories and have a have a fresh be have a fresh start, new beginning, move mm. forward. And I thought that's great because I thought all this reference heavy stuff could be a detriment to the show. Yeah. Um. And I don't know if this was Chidmore's intention or whether he's kind of gave in to the backlash from the last series or maybe he was holding off and then he was just gonna go in full force and be this reference heavy. Uh, or or, or um, reliant on foreknowledge. I don't know, but I I feel like it was the the wrong route to go down. I agree with that. It's sort of funny because um, when it, you know when it was announced, you know we were getting a new Doctor and we were getting a new showrunner. One of the things that I thought at the time was, you know what? I think it'd be quite nice if the show just went back to you know you had uh, you had a self-contained adventure in each episode and you didn't have a story arc you just enjoyed um the story a sort of pretty much you know what the classic era of doctor who did you know that's what i thought you know that's what i wanted mm -hmm. and that's what we got 
Now, keeping aside, you know, because I think some of the stories that we got in Series 11 was good, but I think some of them left me a bit feeling indifferent. Um, leaving that to one side, it did make me think, right, I've kind of got my wish, and I wish I hadn't. Mm. Um, because actually, the way that uh, we consume modern television now is completely different. I love the classic series uh, of Doctor Who, and that still remains my personal preference, although I still like new Doctor Who. Um, but in terms of modern television, I think um, I think what what makes good modern television work now is having a story arc. Is how because actually, funny enough, even though that's what I sort of wanted, and I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I think maybe you wanted that a little bit as well. Am I right? Oh yes, um, yes. View and habits have changed. I'm um, not so much. Uh, I can't really consume big serialized stories now mm. because of uh, the time constraints so i would find it hard to watch a six part story i'd be more inclined to watch a new era story because it's only 45 minutes yeah but i do like serialized drama and an ongoing story arc and this is this is how um this is what grips us, you know, with like yeah. serialized drama. Well, that was interesting. So even though I think that, you know, we both wanted the sort of the individual stories, when we were reviewing that series, you know, we were kind of expecting a story arc. We didn't get one. And as a result of that, we were disappointed. Mm -hmm. And we felt that the show was lacking. And in fact, when we watched The Ghost Monument, we, you know, we both, I think like a lot of people, we clocked onto that reference at the time as child and went, is this is going to be the series story arc? And of course it wasn't. And then it was just, mm. no. And I think... So that didn't work. So I think, uh, I think what that establishes, right? In order for Doctor Who, you know, it has to be a serialized drama. We have to have these, you know, continued story arcs and so on, like every other good drama that's being produced now. But um, I agree with you. I think what he's done in this series, I think he has gone down the wrong route a little bit. Well, well, quite a big bit. Um, and that's what I meant before. You know, when I was saying. In order for this story to make sense, you know, uh, not only for fans, because we, you know, but in order for every, in order for, you know, people to sit down and make sense, the Time Lords had to be explained. The Doctor and the Masters history had to be explained, and the Matrix had to be explained. Mm -hmm. That is a lot to take in. That is a lot to explain. You're dealing with big continuity concepts in the show. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is the wrong approach. Um, yeah. to, to take personally um, you're not allowing the show to develop really because actually all what you're doing is you're focusing entirely on the history and either you can only do one or two things you can well actually you can do three things you can either focus entirely on the history and that's all the show does and therefore it doesn't progress you completely change the show's history and therefore change the entire concept of the show uh, which you know, which I don't think anyone wants to do. You have to update it and change it a little bit. But mm -hmm. all what you do is you do this, which I think has been done here. You do the seemingly massive um, thing with a timeless child, but you've done something where it has changed the, the history of the show, but in a strange way, it also hasn't. Mm -hmm. It's really... It's strange. Yeah. It's, it's almost hit a reset button because now we don't know who the Doctor is. The mm. mystery's back. Yes, the mystery's back, yeah. One problem I have, um, especially in the new era, um, a fundamental part of each series is the fact that it's the companion story. It's their journey. Mm -hmm, yeah. And we, we have all this development. And yes, the companions in the final story that do have the moments, there's not many of them. They're few and far between. Um, and it's quite heavily a Doctor story. And they're just kind of along for the ride. And I feel that's a bit of a disservice to the companions. I agree with that. I think it's interesting. When you look at the show, so you're right. So this thing about the Thomas Child, it has established, you know, a mystery of the Doctor, uh, which I think is, the, which is a good thing. I think is, but I, as I say, I'm a bit indifferent about it, but I'm sort of, I'm not entirely keen on it, but there is that mystery there. Fine. When the show has worked, uh, you know, when it first started, you know, it was establishing we got this character, Doctor Who, you know, who is he? There's this mystery. And what was interesting was way back in the Hartnell era, 
the way that they the, the way that they dealt with that was the doctor was obviously the main character but then so was the, so were the companions you know everyone was given sort of equal billing and that's what continued for the vast majority of the show's run what is interesting is that in season 26 the very final season of classic doctor who they ended up changing the relationship and the focus of the doctor and the companion to such an extent where you know, looking back at it in hindsight, that's what the show did when it came back. You know, with Christopher Eccleston, with David, you know, there was that focus of, you know, the Doctor's there, but there's a companion. And yet, and mm. that's when the show's at its best. The Doctor is this mysterious figure, and but we're watching the adventures through the companion's eyes, and I think that's when the show works very well. Um, you have to empathise and relate to it, don't you? Yeah, and I think the... Uh, yeah... There were one or two moments, particularly with Yaz, uh, and especially with Mandib Gill's performance, uh, there were some really nice emotional moments, you know, when they're back on Earth. And there's a bit where, you know, Yaz is, you know, clearly emotional because, well, you know, where's the Doctor? The doc- you know, Because at that point, they think the Doctor's been killed, is, is died. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and she's fighting back the tears a bit, and it's, you know, and a, a sort of like a mouth wobbles a bit. It's a great sort of performance. And mm-hmm. I think what all we said is that, you know, Yaz has the potential of being a good character, and especially because you've got a cracking good actress playing the part. The potential's not being used. Um, so, yeah, a bit disappointed with that. Um, just before we sort of like stop wrapping the episode up, so we get the Cyber Time Lords. Hmm, yes, interesting look. They do look good. They do look good. It's sort of. They could, that, they could look comic. You know, because basically you have got, you know, cyber Cybermen heads with these big Gallifreyan wings coming out. Mm. But yeah. actually it does sort of look, you know, and these Gallifreyan d- uh, designs all over, the, it does sort of look good. They, they have managed, because that could easily look, you know, that could have easily gone down a comic book. It does look good. It looks looks odd, but it looks good. Yeah, especially with the capes of the cloaks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Looked like, yeah, sort of like Cyber Centurion time lord yeah. things. Mm. So the Doctor has now escaped the Matrix, uh, and just as she escaped, uh, very good timing, um, she uh, she's then reunited with um, you know with the with the humans and her companions again. It did the fam. The she's, fa- she's, she's glad to see them. Oh God! Well, the extended fam. Oh yeah. Um, I don't know why, because there's times in the past, the previous episodes that hasn't bothered me. I found it a bit cringe on this occasion. But my fam. <laughs> oh, gee, I don't know why I, I just cringed and the fact that, you know, I think she mentions it two or three times in this episode. But anyway. Um, it, it just shows that she's in a healthy place, though, like, regardless of everything she's just experienced, she's she's still, she's back in the present and appreciates who she is mm-hmm, um, with, yep. with help, with the help of what, what Ruth said. Uh, Ruth Doctor, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, she'd said, um, "Does it really matter? Um, does it really make a difference to who you are now?" Mm-hmm. Um, and the Doctor's come to this realization that um, no, it makes her stronger. Um, so it shows that she's in a good place. Yeah. But, but we do kind of cringe anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's just fine. Yeah, it's a really good place, but you know, I, I, it is a bit cringy. Um, but it's good. You know, she's just just confident. It's good. It's good to have her back. Um. But I did feel that that sort of that felt a bit sort of rushed. Uh, you know, she suddenly awoke from the Matrix and said, like, "Yay, everyone's here!" I just thought it was a bit uh, um, uh, slightly comic timing. But anyway, um, so then it's right a case that they they decide to blow the Cyberman ship yeah. up and all the Cybermen along with them. Would this be double genocide? <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, and then they all decide to, you know, then they all sort of have to, right, escape into, um, uh, escape in a TARDIS uh, to Earth. But the Doctor realises has to destroy the Master and these Cyber Time Lord things uh, because they'll be invincible. And she decides to do this by, because um, there's, a, there's a grenade that, that can only be detonated by hand. So it's sort of like a suicide mission now. To blow herself up along with the master and these cyber time lords. Yeah, so they go back to the matrix chamber. Yep. Um, and the master kind of proclaims victory here. You know, he believes he's broken the doctor. Um, 
and he'll be able to kind of continue with his new Cyber Legion. Yeah, I mean, I never understood that. Why did he think that the Doctor would be broken by the reveal that she's the Timeless Child? Yes, there would be questions to ask, but the idea it would break her. I Maybe he was focusing more on the initial realisation of a new past. Maybe he didn't think too far ahead. Yeah, because he was really anticipating telling her, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. He so was. maybe maybe his focus was mainly on that, and he didn't think about um, her coming to terms with that. Mm. And but he says, um, she says he's given her the gift of herself. Mm-hmm. Um, so now maybe all the master's efforts were in vain. However, the final part of his plan comes into play when the doctor threatens to use the death particle against him, and. Um, he dares her to, you know, it's like a gun to the head. I love this moment. He's like, go on. Yeah, do it, do it, do it now. Um, <laughs> it is, uh, it's It's better written and performed than that, yeah. but you get the idea. Um, yeah, but of course, as we know, that the, the Doctor can't do it. And, you know, the, I quite like, you know, the, the Master's reaction, which is, you know, I'm going to make sure that, you know, I'm going to destroy everything uh, because of your cowardness just now. Um... And then Koshamus comes wandering in. Oh, I love this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then just runs. What a guy. <laughs> yeah, what a guy. He's just, <laughs> don't worry, I'll do it. Mm. Um, oh, and I love that it's revealed that it was him that sent the Siberian back, or rather him and the Resistance. Yeah, one of them. So he's like a bit of a John Connor now, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is. This is, Doctor's jo- uh, this is Doctor Who's John Connor. Yeah. Um, so he comes, a, he just comes a wald- wandering in, saving the day. The Doctor naffs off. Uh, yeah. He gets shot, but blows everyone up. Um, the, yes, he gets shot. How many times he still manages to press that switch. button? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. What a guy! Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So that, so that happens. Um, I love the TARDIS house. So the ta- yes, the the um, the detached three bedroom house. <laughs> <laughs> love that. That was fantastic. Um, so this is the this is the, the TARDIS that was used to get um, Yaz, Graham, and Ryan and the other two uh, humans uh, to twenty first century Earth. Did make me did make me wonder now is going well. I hope for the Doctor's sake she she said it for twenty twenty one when the COVID virus is gone, so they don't oh have to live God. through this crap. They'll be <laughs> si- living in isolation inside the TARDIS. Yeah, just going off oh, for God's sake. I, I I wish a Cyberman had just killed me. Uh, <laughs> rather than go through this nonsense. Um, we will never know. <laughs> uh, I just, I did, I did generally like that the three yeah. bedroom TARDIS house landing, <laughs> which is glorious. Um, the do- the doctor's escaped through another TARDIS, which dis- it, is disguised as, as yeah, a tree. An- another Ruth era TARDIS, but this one has a bit of a purple glow. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Um, and um, it, it's a tree. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a tree. I did actually feel sorry for the TARDIS because now it's it's left Gallifrey, but now it's going to be stuck in a quarry on for Earth eternity. For eternity. As a tree. Yeah. It need not worry. We'll be back to that quarry soon for another story. <laughs> or will we? Because uh, we don't know where Doctor Who's going to come back now. Oh, yes. Um, For once, we'll want it to have another gap. Well, of course, it's going to have another gap, yeah, but... I think we need a year to digest all this. Oh, I can't be arsed with this. <laughs> Do I have to think about this even more? Um, yeah, okay. Or to come to terms with it. Come to terms with yeah, it, maybe, maybe we'll have forgotten about it. And they'll just wreck on it. How, you, <laughs> nothing ventured, nothing blown. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> we should call this podcast that. Oh, yeah, should now. Yeah. Welcome to the Never Ventured Nothing Blowing podcast. Um, yeah, so th- uh, so the Doctor is finally reunited with the TARDIS, which we haven't. We haven't. It feels like we haven't seen in ages. Because mm-hmm. it wasn't in the uh, the Villa episode, was it? No. Oh no, no! Hang on, it was. Sorry, very briefly at the end, it was. Oh, um, okay. But it feels ages anyway. Um, you know, and obviously the Doctor has to catch her breath a bit, and um, before she takes off and decide, you know, to to go and see uh, the fam, um, which is understandable. I thought that was quite a nice moment. You know, she's just got to rest, take things in, which is what we're going to have to do as well, as you said. Um, but then, yeah, what happens next? Uh, 
the Jadoon arrive, said that they've opened up a cold case, and then popped the Doctor into a prison for the whole of eternity. Hmm. And then we'll have a, a bit of a David Tennant moment, which is like, what? What? <laughs> what? Uh, yeah. Uh, and then, and then that's it. It's like, what the hell? I quite like the ending, actually, and I, I'm looking forward to the next episode, um, which, by the looks of it, is going to have the Daleks back. Um, mm. And it's already fil- finished production. Yeah, so uh, I do think it will be broadcast at the end of the year as a Christmas special, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so looking forward to that. Will the extended fam be around for the next episode? <laughs> well, isn't isn't it the case... Th- isn't it rumoured that uh, Ryan and Graham will be leaving? Yes, I, I, I've heard that. We'll see. Because I think mm. the actors have been contracted to another series. Ah, right, okay. Um, and this semi-detached house, will we never speak of that again? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I've just got it's like little... the Master's TARDIS in Spyfall Part 2. What did the Doctor do with that? She must have just abandoned it somewhere. Like the tree. Yeah, maybe. So, um, before we uh, sort of wrap up and summarise our views, uh, here's listeners' responses. So, Badwolf66 got on contact, uh, got in contact with us via Twitter, and said, "Wow. Well, let's just say it caused a shitstorm of criticism, and the Cybermen were heavily underused when the Master returned." Uh, rest in peace, Ashad. What a waste of a character. He could have been a voice for the Cybermen, like Davros is the voice for the Daleks. I didn't care much for the Timeless Child part. I was more interested in the Cybermen. Why can no one write them properly these days? This is why we need big Finnish writers to take up the head writership. The Cybermasters, or Cyberlords as they should be called, just look weird to me without the handlebars. It was nice to see five types of Cybermen throughout this three-part story arc, which is a, ri- which is a, a rarity for Doctor Who. Normally you would only get one type of story, two if you're lucky, Cyber Zealot, Cyber Mondasian, Cyber Drone, Cyber Warriors and Cy- Cyber Lords. Uh, yeah, he's right there actually, that's one thing I forgot to comment on. We do see v- various types of Cybermen here, and that is that is quite nice. And yeah, yeah. totally agree with you about Ashad, as, as we said before, I felt um, getting rid of him is, was a, is a waste of a character, but... Um, I do agree with that. Uh... It's one of the big regrets of the episode, probably. With regards to the Cybermen being part of the episode, um, after Ashad was gone, um, they didn't feel that relevant anymore. Just one of them kind of gone from the story. I don't see them as this great power for the kind of the master to to use. They're certainly not on par with the Daleks. Yeah, agree. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, the, obviously, the Cybermen are the, you know one of the great villains, and for a lot of people, the Cybermen are you know the, the best villain. I've always thought that the Cybermen are a much better idea than they have been realised. Don't get me wrong, there are great Cybermen stories, but I think there are much better Dalek stories than they are Cybermen ones. Greg Campbell said, Vandalism rewrote the Doctor's background in a needlessly divisive way that left many fans furious and the casual viewer baffled. Horrid fan fiction that shouldn't have seen the light of day been a fan for 30 years but will no longer watch unless Chibnall goes and is retconned no I mean I can understand what I mean because as I said I'm sort of indifferent to it but there are elements of that idea that I don't like mm-hmm. I, I can't see why it would um, um, you know a lot I can see why people would dislike the idea and I do agree saying that you know it certainly would have left the casual viewer baffled Joey said, sort of in countenance to that, actually, sort of well as a, as a balance to that. Uh, Joey says, an exciting development offering storytelling possibilities for the future and a continuation of Doctor Who, making it up as it goes along. The Whitaker, uh, Dewan scenes are very strong. I uh, can't argue with that. Some great face-offs. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. So they, they have just their, their scenes are uh, electric. They're they're great. Totally agree with that. Um, it's interesting with what Joey Sane is saying this is an exciting development and offering storytelling possibilities. He's right, but I've got a sneaking suspicion it's not really going to be... Well, it has to be. The, the, the division side of it has to be explored. And the Doctor's asked the question, 
how many of me are out there. Um, I think that's probably her directive now for the future, you know, looking into her past possibly. I do hope we'll get more of uh, Ruth's Doctor. Yes, I definitely agree with that because I think Joe Martin is just absolutely fantastic. And um, yeah, I would definitely like to see more of uh, Joe Martin popping up. But beyond that, I've got a sneak... I mean, because you're right, it's the logical thing to do. But I've got a sneaking suspicion that, with the exception of Joe Martin popping up every now and again, possibly, I don't think this is going to be... I don't think this is going to be looked into Mm. a lot. But we'll see. You know, we're just kind of believing what the Master's saying. What if the Doctor isn't the Timeless Child? That's a massive conversation. Let's have that another time. (laughs) But that renders this whole episode pointless. Um, well, this episode rendered the last one pointless. Yeah, and how we don't we buy that? Drew H. Bobbin said, strangely lacking on the drama format. In spite of the huge stakes, the episode literally says that the Doctor's past doesn't define her anyway, so having spent the best part of 35 minutes on it is odd. It looks great though, and it's musically top-notch. For me, the conflation of the Timeless Child and the Doctor is a misstep. Being the Timeless Child would have been a more convincing motive for the Master, and the Doctor could have easily still been haunted by a forgotten past, as embodied by Ruth. I can forgive lapses in logic as easily as anyone, but the off-screen destruction of Gallifrey isn't convincing at any part, and the regenerating corpses of the Time Lords and Cyber Armor doesn't seem to follow what we know about either of them. That aside, Jodie is great throughout, as an Obi-Wan, Selmy, and of course, the menacing Sasha Master. I'm looking forward to where we go next, even if this episode was clunkier than I would have liked. Hoping for a 13 Ruth two-hander episode next year. Yeah, I I actually think um, Drew H. Bobbins there sums up quite a lot about how I feel about the episode. Um, yes, totally agree with that last point, certainly. Like we said before, would like uh, the 13th and Ruth to come up again. Because, um, yeah, great doctor, and um, yeah, definitely agree with that. And yes, I actually think for. Because I was sort of going to say this in my summing up, but I did feel that the episode was strangely lacking on the drama didn't feel as gripping as it should have been given you know how big the episode was supposed to be and for some of the things that we are told yes. um i feel like the timeless children is is more impressive from the technical production side of things so you know in terms of you know the, the you know the, the the things that were involved in making it, so the, the production side from the costumes, the music, the you know the cinematography, uh, the set designs, the music is just, you know that's when the episode's you know good, it looks good. Um, but yeah, I just uh, I agree that the drama was lacking a bit. And the the off-screen descri- destruction of Gallifrey um, is a bit of a hole there in the narrative that. I would like to know more about the master claims to have destroyed Gallifrey and killed everyone. Mm. Um, he also claims to have been hacking the Matrix, and then he discovered the truth about the Timeless Child. Yeah. And now, do we presume that he killed the Time Lords after learning the this truth about the Timeless Child? Is that what we should assume? I th- yes, I think so, because it, it it seems to be that what he learned about the Timeless Child is what made which turned him. You know, psychotic yeah. and murder everyone. I wonder if this offers a, offers a clue to how we get from Missy to here, because if the mm. master claims he was in the Matrix hacking it, what if we go by this interpretation that Missy was uploaded to the Matrix, and the master's consciousness in the Matrix learnt this and then broke free in true master tradition of finding finding a way to live yeah that's it that's actually interesting i quite like that idea i mean because mm-hmm. it, it fits mm-hmm. with what's been established in the show it's not beyond the realm of possibility and uh it makes sense yeah i quite like that idea doctor who the target world podcast uh said that's great an average story some good bits between the doctor and the master 
Theta Sigma's Doctor Who podcast said, good spectacle, but wasted opportunity story-wise. In the words of Brigadier Winfred Bambra, oh shame. Oh yeah, I remember the first time I watched Battlefield, uh, I think it when it came out on VHS in 98, I think. I remember watching it, and uh, there's a bit where um, uh, Brigadier Bambera, she goes, oh shit. And I'm going, is this the first time? I honestly thought she was going to go, oh shit. And I'm going, bloody hell, Doctor Who got brave in the late 80s. But yeah, it was just, oh, uh, oh shame. Okay. So um, just before we do a final um, summing up, um, just to let you know that uh, you can obviously, because we've just um, read out some of the listeners' responses, you can get in contact with us on social media. Um, please do, because we do like hearing from you. Um, getting a you know, uh, interesting uh, variety of of um, opinions on the episode. So we're on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash cloisterbell. We're on Twitter at podcastbell, Instagram, cloister underscore bell. And uh, we have actually changed the website. Very easy to find. New website address. It's cloisterbellpodcast.com. Yeah, very simple. The old address will work, cloisterbell.co.uk. Um, we'll redirect you there. But yes, we've had a, a slight redesign, make things a bit more accessible there. And um, hopefully add more content to the website in some shape or form. Yes, uh, we've been wanting to do that for a while, and um, given that we have a bit more time to play with because we're stuck in the house, um, we're hoping to uh, to get a bit more podcast, a uh, bit more sort of material out to you. Um, obviously, we're, we're still very busy with, with other things, but uh, we do we're, we've got some ideas uh, that we're wanting to try out. Uh, so keep an eye out. Um, so okay, wrapping things up. So interesting episode not necessarily for the right reasons or maybe so uh but we've discussed it so rob in terms of a conclusion and given the episode a score where do you stand a bit sad to see that the companions um weren't the focus of the finale okay. um they did get the moments like i said um a big plus i guess for the show in general the mystery's back we thought we knew everything about the doctor and all the mysteries surrounding her um Time Lords no longer hold the same status they did, unfortunately, which might um, pose a problem. And will the Doctor hold them in the same regard? Who knows? I think for the fact that this episode has been quite brave to shake things up, I think I have to give it some merit there. Um, so I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. Ah, right, okay. That's uh, that's quite a respectable score. I do agree with you uh, that it um, the fact that they're willing to be brave and shake things up should be applauded. Um, you know, you want to sh- you don't want the show to be, you know, entirely safe. Um, my feelings on it, having said that, though, is I agree with some of what the listeners said. It was that <sighs> felt it sort of lacked on the drama department. I don't know what it is. I feel that. Um, I didn't find it as gripping as I should have. Um, there are things to admire. It, it, there are things to admire in the episode, um, and there are moments and scenes which are strong. And a lot of the, you know, uh, the, the cast are superb. Um, but I think a l- really the, the 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 big merits of the episode are in terms of how it looks and sounds, rather than the story itself. I've given it 6 out of 10, uh, slightly above average. Mm. Um, I think it's, overall, I think it's a decent idea. Um, But actually, what this reminded me of was it feels like a bit of a virgin new adventure. And with the Cyber Time Lords, a bit like it came from a Doctor Who comic. There's nothing wrong with those things. Um, but it, I just felt I don't know whether it necessarily makes for great television. Um, so I, I think really at the end of it, which is a bit odd considering, you know, this this significant thing about the timeless child. Um, I actually think that the episode's slightly above average. It won't go down in my mind as a great Cyberman episode, mm. um, despite the amazing sets of the cyber carrier in the new aesthetic they've got yeah i think that's all it'll be remembered for um the visuals of it again it's just it's not it's not 
it's a wasted opportunity for a Saberman story. So on that disappointment, um, we hope you have enjoyed um, listening to us review The Timeless Children. Uh, we will be back very soon looking at um, other Doctor Who stories. Yep. Um, so stay tuned. Yep. Take it easy. Stay safe. Yes, stay safe. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>